morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you again this morning. I wanted you to know, to begin this message, just of, of my gratefulness for you and love for you on behalf of Aaron as well. We, we just love this church, and one of the reasons I love you is because you love God's Word. Uh, if you are a, a, a member, you are on our email list, and so you would have received an email this week uh, just alerting you that the next passage in Ephesians, we, we just preach right through the Bible, and so what that means is that we come to passages that um, <laughs> are challenging topically, and this is one of those weeks. This is a, a difficult topic to preach. It is an um, important topic to hear, and I was struck this morning as we were in pre-meeting prayer Uh, Just what a gift it is to have a church that knows the passage we're going to be preaching and desires to come and hear from God's Word Uh, anyway. If you are a guest uh, or you didn't see the email or you didn't think about the email or or whatever, um, just to alert you, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 3 through 6. So I'll give you a second just to turn there and glance over it. Uh, If if you uh, are uncomfortable with your older children, you know, being a part of this passage or for whatever reason, we do have that classroom that is available this morning specifically to serve you. Um, not, not recommending that in any way. I'm just saying if that serves you, um, that is available. So uh, certainly we, we would entrust to parents uh, the usefulness of when their children hear about certain topics and the best time of that. That's, a, that's an excellent parental decision to make. So uh, anyway, just want to serve wherever different children are this morning. So I'm telling you this now just, just so that you're forewarned about that ahead of time. And if you're a guest, uh, just so we don't talk about these topics every Sunday. We just preach right through the book, and we bring it as it comes. Uh, so that's what we're doing this morning. So I'd like to read now Ephesians chapter 5, verses three through six, and as I read and as I head into the message, I I would like to ask for your prayer. I would like to ask for your prayer for me personally. Uh, There has been a sobriety about this passage this week, a a weakness as I was anticipating it, a week in a couple of ways. This passage speaks into a degree of temptation that is present in our culture, a way of thinking that is contrary to God's word, that renders the need for it so urgent. It also speaks into a topic in the lives of genuine Christians where the pain and difficulty of battling a besetting sin can be so real and so burdensome And so my heart this morning is somehow to bring the firmness of the warning of this passage while simultaneously communicating uh, sympathy and encouragement and comfort in grace to those who are genuinely battling against this sin. And certainly to include myself under the authority of this passage renders it weak as well because I tremble to consider the words here for my own heart and for the heart of the church. So I I would just be grateful to uh, receive your prayers even as we read and as we launch launch into this message because we we want God's word to do both this morning, to warn and to comfort. I pray you would pray for me and pray for all of us that that would take place. Let's read together Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place but instead Let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. 
For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Not too long ago, my friend told me that on his way to work one morning, abruptly and unexpectedly, his phone began talking to him. And if I remember correctly, the phone said, you have so many miles to go before you reach work. It was very unexpected. He hasn't asked the phone to do this. It was speaking voluntarily this information, and he was disturbed to discover that his phone knew where he was going. Not just the direction, not just the location, but the the ultimate destination that his direction indicated. He was disturbed about this. I would have been disturbed about this. My phone hasn't done that yet, but I might throw it out the window if it ever does. Uh, It's disturbing to think that a phone could know that, but it's not surprising given GPS technology and patternistic computer systems, uh, that it could predict, based on a pattern, the direction you're going. I am not technological at all, and I could uh, see how a phone could do that. It can predict, based on pattern, the direction you're heading. It can predict that. It can give a, a reasonable guess, based on this pattern in your life, Here is the direction you're heading. This passage does exactly the same thing. It does exactly the same thing. Paul says to his dearly beloved friends in the Ephesian church, a truth about humankind. It's an observation. It's a fact. It's a statement. He's not looking into any person's heart and assuming this is true of them. He's just saying, this is just a a fact of God's world that you can bank on, you can be sure of. Let me allow God's word to speak into your world and say this. Our pattern of purity reveals our eternal direction. Our pattern of purity reveals, doesn't create, doesn't establish, but it does reveal our eternal direction. Isn't that essentially, if we could summarize, you notice I I tend to do this every week. I think it's a helpful preaching habit. I would encourage you to do this as a Bible study habit. You take a paragraph, try to summarize the main point that he is making, and then all the details begin to fall into place. That's all I'm doing right now. He has this initial section in here where he talks about God's standard of purity, and then that flows into God's judgment on impurity. So that's the flow of the passage. Wouldn't you agree? Look down there. There's the standard of purity. Here's God's standard of purity. It comes in the form of a command that we're to honor, we're to live up to. Don't do this, Paul says. Here's God's standard of purity. You're to honor And the reason for that, that's stated, notice 4 in verse 5, 4, the reason for that is that God has a judgment in store for a pattern of impurity. That's the flow of the passage, and so I think you put those together and summarize it and say, our pattern of purity reveals our eternal direction. It's a, it's a sobering progression. That's the progression of the passage. Let's, let's walk through this progression and look at some of the details here. First, God's standard of purity. That's how God, Paul begins. God's standard of purity. This, this flows out of uh, the beginning of chapter 5 where, where, where uh, Paul has said, Therefore, be imitators of God. Be like little children, in other words, little loved children who just are desirous of being like their heavenly Father. That, that should be our heart. And, of course, chapter 5 flows out of the first three chapters in Ephesians where Paul communicates identity. You were called, you were chosen, you were adopted, you were given an inheritance. The Holy Spirit is within you and you've been placed in a gospel community that's displaying God's wisdom to the angelic world and God has a purpose for the church and every member of it to display the power of his gospel. This is who you are. Now, here's the implication. As beloved children, imitate your heavenly father. And here's a contrasting negative trait that has no place in those called in this way. He lists God's standard, God's view. So our heavenly father is giving us his view of purity. Here's his perspective. Here's his standard. 
that we are to live up to, that should be our standard since we are his children, chosen by the grace of God. God's standard of purity. Let's look at the details here. Sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. What he's doing here is he is he's making this categorical, and it's categorical, you notice there, because of the number of terms he uses. Paul is just determined to remove any and all mental loopholes regarding this topic. Immorality, impurity, and in case there's any sense that this particular type of indulgence is not covered in those first couple of terms. He includes covetousness, which is any craving for that which God has forbidden or even that which God has not given to idolize it in a particular way. So there's just no Christian or no human being who can escape the absolute forbidden uh, state of those things God has forbidden or those things God has not given. To live for those things is forbidden of the people of God. And in particular, the accent here is immorality, impurity. And he he uses this phrase, not even be named, I I think as a, a sort of lesser to the greater argument. God's view of impurity is so strong, is so absolute, that even the naming of these things should be repugnant to a child of God. And the argument would go, if even naming them is repugnant, how much more the practice of them? That's the argument that seems to be, be, be on, on display here. Look, God, God despises even the naming of these things. Now, again, obviously, the passage itself names them, so he's not talking about just using the words. He's talking about to to give even vocal approval or acceptance in any way, to discuss them in anything other than absolute rejection and righteous unholiness. Righteousness and holiness, that, that, that that is to be out of place in the children of God, he says. Not, not even to be named among you. Absolute taboo, even in vocabulary. He's he's establishing God's perspective, God's standard. And then he, he gives the reason. The reason for these things are just peppered through here. It's proper among saints that this kind of impurity not even be named, let alone practiced. What, what does the word saints mean? Well, it means God's holy ones, God's, those that God has set apart to himself. It's a privileged word that also combines calling. You've been set apart. We're, we're to be like God. We're to represent God. We're to stand for God. We're the saints. We're the holy ones through no merit of our own. We don't become saints by what we practice, but we reveal our identity as saints, and we should live in ways that is proper to saints. What is proper to the holy ones? I was thinking this week about a a scene where a person might be in the courtroom of the king. I think that's kind of what he's getting to here. Things that you might feel free to do uh, on your own or in the backyard, if you even think just of of a, a silly example like, you know, mud all over yourself or just wallowing in a, in a dirty condition, and then you, you come into the courtroom of the king, and there's something that's just out of place. It's out of place in that way. And he's saying, in a sobering way, this is out of place. Th- this kind of behavior and even the naming of it has no place as God's holy one which is your identity in Christ if you're a Christian. Those who are Christians are God's holy ones. They have been set apart. They have been chosen. And this has has no place. We're called to honor God's standard of purity. And, And Paul and the Lord inspiring Paul takes this so seriously. So seriously, he doesn't stop there as if there were any loopholes. There are none, but he doesn't stop there. He continues to our vocabulary and how it can be out of place as we relate to these things. Verse four, let there be no filthiness, 
the heart covered in filthy thoughts, the mouth speaking foolish talk, talk that is not in keeping with the wisdom of God, that is in keeping with the upside-down kingdom of the world in which selfish pleasure is exalted above all things. He says, no, no, no place. Foolish talk nor crude joking. God does not laugh at crude jokes. He does not smile at crude jokes. According to this passage, he judges crude joking. This is a category where I felt weak. I I felt convicted and I felt weak, but I, I wanted to bring it up this morning. There is a way of giving approval to these things that takes place in particular in social media and in entertainment. Because the screen gives us a sense of distance from participation in these things, we can assume a certain sense of security and of distance. But before the Lord, what we watch, we, if we're watching it for pleasure, we are in some ways participating in. And this passage makes it clear that, that even the tacit approval of crude joking is totally out of place for those who say God's standard of purity is absolute. Now, I, I, to be honest, I, there have definitely been times where a television show or some moment that I see some meme or something, and it has an, an undertone or maybe even an overtone of some kind of sexual reference or just a little bit of humor, just a bit thrown in there. Maybe it's more explicit. And it, it, it reveals my heart when anything other than grief or righteous indignation flows out. Now, some of you may be more godly in this way than I am. Some of you may struggle in a similar way. Some of you may struggle in a greater way. I don't know. But the point is, I want to bring this before us and let God's word speak to us. In God's eyes, there is no distance between us and the screen. Not really. Let me encourage you to be honest before a gracious but holy God. Has there been subtle or consumer-driven approval of filthiness, foolish talk, or crude joking. It must not even be named. I do not mean a kind of self-righteous, standoffish stance towards the culture, those people that watch these things. Because Paul says to the Corinthians, look, (laughs) where he speaks elsewhere, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were set apart. Such were some of you. There's no self-righteousness here, but there is a broken humility. There is a grief This kind of trivialization of sexual sin is pervasive in the culture. It is the air we breathe. It is the water we live within. It is so constant. And yet if we could just transport every moment in private in front of a screen or in front of a magazine or in a moment on watching something or in an interaction with another person, we could just transport ourselves to where we truly are by faith into the presence of God in his throne room in Christ. It makes it crystal clear those things which are out of place must not even be named except in a holy brokenness or a holy indignation towards sin. Now, let me make a a, a caveat here. 
which I think is also important in the culture because sin is so deceitful. It works two things at once, and the culture does this. The Bible is not against righteous sexuality. Actually, the Bible says God invented it. The Bible says God is for it. If you read the Song of Solomon, uh, it, there's a celebration of the pleasure of human sexuality and the desire that is God-given for human sexuality in the context of a covenant relationship between husband and wife. That context, which God created in his wisdom as a safe and permanent covenant, creates a protection for the vulnerability and exposure that is sexuality. And in God's wisdom, he said, I'm going to create this perfect, permanent protection where rejection is not allowed, where shaming is not allowed, where a Experiments with various people is not allowed. This right here is a protected place before the Lord where the joy that I have created can be experienced freely and without shame or conviction. So if by chance you're here and, and you, you're just walking in this Sunday and you had no idea what the message was going to be about, uh, God bless you and thanks for coming. Please come back next week. Uh, but if you grew up in a, in a place where you've heard, man, Christians, they just hate pleasure. They just think it's gross and weird, and I think that's weird. That's totally not the case. The Bible and biblical thinking celebrates this area of human experience as a gift from God. God created pleasure because it wouldn't exist in the world unless he had created it for good, and then it's been marred and distorted by sin. The lie of lust is that forbidden pleasures are more enduringly joyful than God-given ones. That is frankly not true. Now, here's where they are different. Forbidden pleasure functions, like all sin, a little bit like Red Bull or any kind of energy drink. There is an immediate high, a ecstatic, enthusiastic, pleasurable enjoyment, followed by a crash and a craving for more. God's pleasures operate normally more slowly, but more enduringly and more ecstatically because they are sustained by God, they are free from guilt, and they endure for increasing joy into the future. And they're not constantly craving the new and untried, which eventually runs out. The lie is that the best we can have is instant high and big crash. And if you know, if you've had energy drinks or actually any kind of that kind of consumption, you know eventually the highs get less high, the lows get more low, and there becomes a dullness to feel at all. There becomes a desperation to feel something. There becomes a, a hunger to find some new way to make it new and exciting because that's all there is. Unlike godly pleasure, which gets sweeter with age. Having said that, we need to be warned about God's standard what the scripture says is that homosexual practice, pornography, lust, adultery, fornication, masturbation, all are seeking the impurity and sexual immorality absolutely forbidden here. And lest there be some who indulge in cravings of a non-sexual nature, remember that God includes the underlying category of covetousness, craving that which God has not given or God has forbidden in an idolatrous way without trust in him. These things should not even be named. And he includes the approval or the recognition of them in crude speech. God does not laugh at crude humor, nor should his children nor should I, nor should you. Brothers and sisters, what is the current pattern of our purity in life, thought, or speech? Pause before a gracious and holy God and answer that question honestly. Pause for a moment. God is gracious and holy. 
answer the question, what is the current pattern of your purity? Pattern is an intentional word. Christians sin. Christians stumble. Sometimes Christians struggle for years with the ups and downs of a fight. But what is the pattern that defines your life? What is the pattern of our purity in life, thought, or speech? Brothers, what is the current pattern of our purity online or on our phone? What is our web history? What is our mental history? How do we interact with those that are around us? Sisters, I wish I could say that sexual temptation is limited to men. It is not. It might surprise you to know that in my pastoral experience, there, frankly, is not a limit to men of disastrous sexual sin. Our culture is racing to celebrate female lust to the catastrophic degree that male lust has been celebrated for decades. Don't be deceived. What is the current pattern of our purity in life, thought, or speech? Now, if this first part of the passage does not sober us, simply by the stating of the standard, the reason Paul states it increases that sobriety, and it makes our honest answer to that question so important. If we will answer that question honestly, there is hope. If we attempt to be deceived and minimized, there is not hope. Answer it honestly, and there is hope. Here's why it's so important. God's judgment on impurity. Point number two. Four, he says, verse five. Four, you may be sure. Oh, let us feel the truthfulness of that word. You may be sure. Count on it. Trust it. Bank on it. Not going anywhere. God's not changing his mind. It will never be lessened. You may be sure. You may be sure, he says, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, just listing the same categories, that is an adulterer, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Notice the contrast presented in here. You may be sure, don't be deceived. You are children, he says in verse 1. Don't be sons of disobedience because the sons of disobedience will experience the wrath of God. For what? For these things. Now, feel the carefulness of Paul's words here. Notice he does not say that those who are pure earn an inheritance. Notice he says that if you want to see what your inheritance is, your eternal direction is, your pattern of purity reveals it. This is not legalism. This is not earning our way to heaven one pure act at a time. No, this is revealing that those who are washed walk in purity and those who are unwashed live in impurity as the pattern of their life. This is what Paul is saying. And he reminds them of the gospel privilege that is present for every Christian in these words. He reminds them of it. And for true Christian, that inheritance is so valuable, this is a sobering warning. They want to live out of their inheritance as God's heavenly people headed to heaven, intending to see God face to face, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ who died for sexual sin. He reminds them of it. He says, look, remember what I said in chapter one. You have an inheritance, you genuine Christian. You're heading to heaven. You've been granted the Spirit of God. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You have a deposit that can't be taken away from you. As such, you hate defiling sin. On the contrary, if you are one of those who merely claims the Christian status, you should not be deceived. 
the claim of a Christian status is revealed in a walk of purity. There are many people in our country who claim a Christian status who do not know Christ as Savior and Lord. The circle of those who claim a Christian status is larger than the circle of those who have claimed Jesus as Savior and Lord. That is simply the case. It's true throughout the scriptures. Merely to claim to be a Christian is not to be a Christian. How do we know the difference? God doesn't stamp it on our foreheads. How do we know? Well, we look at things like our purity to give evidence to reveal where the inheritance of the Holy Spirit deposited in us has made us God's children. And we look at this pattern to say and to answer honestly, is my pattern of purity revealing a direction towards seeing God face to face? Make no doubt, Paul says. Those who put before their faces or before their lives a consistent pursuit of this kind of impurity are not those whose faces are turned to God and going to heaven. It makes total biblical sense. How could those who indulge passionately in that which God hates be those who are passionate about seeing God? They can't, Paul says. So feel God's judgment on impurity. I I, I love the faithful kindness of God's word in speaking truth into a culture of deceit. Notice he emphasizes here, he does the same thing in 1 Corinthians. He emphasizes the danger of deceit in this particular category. What, What a gift of God. Let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. He is aware that this sin has a particularly deceptive category to it. And anyone, and probably all of us at some level who've struggled in this, this category, know that to be true. There's a deceptiveness. It's not that bad. It's just one time. This isn't as bad as something else. You'll make up for it tomorrow. It's been a long day. I'm tired, no one will know. You could list the lies associated with this particular category of sin forever. We all know that to be the case. I won't watch this, I'll just look at that. It's just a friendly conversation. We're just good friends. I need someone to talk to. The lies are overwhelming. They're overwhelming. I experience them. You experience them. They are just overwhelming. The lies and the culture adds to those self lies that we tell ourselves that sin tells us. They adds the lie that, you know what? It's all about love. My needs are paramount. And what I mean by needs is whatever I happen to desire at the moment. The Bible says your needs are confused by your desires, which are affected by sin. You need the clarity of the result, the direction. You need to be told very clearly. God's word has to startle us and tell us the direction that this pattern indicates. It needs to startle us because we can live in the fog in this category. So it startles us. And it says, those who live this way, here's the truth. Let it penetrate this this, this deep problem that our culture has. Let Let it break in. Let it communicate to us. Let it break in and tell us, this is the end. This is the conclusion of this road. This is the destination. This is the final direction. This is the final result. Here's the truth. Lustful temporary pleasures lived as a pattern of life will not inherit the kingdom of God and of Christ. And because of these things, God will pour out wrath on the sons of disobedience. Now you you ask yourself honestly, what is the cultural lie in comparison to that? No consequences. Don't hurt anybody, but there will be no consequences. I think it is absolutely intentional that this passage flows out of a passage about loving one another and about being children of God. Because it is not just we who are involved. It is the other person 
as well, whether the other person representatively on a screen or the actual other person, the other person as well. It is an absolute failure of love to indulge or consume or pursue another person in a way that will undermine and will be reveal a pattern in their life of lacking an inheritance in God. Lust thrives on self-centeredness that takes no interest in the other person's eternal welfare. And so this flows right out of love one another. Why? Because you can't love a person and help them to reveal a pattern. That direction, the final destiny, is God's judgment. And you certainly can't reflect God by indulging in that pattern too. Actually, the wrath of God falls on the sons of disobedience. I think the kind of person that is in view here and the statement of this deceit is the American Christian who is overwhelmed by the minimization and the humor and the trivialization of this kind of sin on a daily basis. Our very language, our very language minimizes it. Which I'm guilty of and you're guilty of. They got together. I was hoping they would get together in the end of that show. They've been together for a while. I'm not saying we use the most bombastic language when we're talking about our neighbor and we're trying to be, if, attempt to be gracious and that sort of thing and not, not just speak prophetically every moment, obviously. But in our own souls, we must guard against euphemistic language that is describing practices that are hellbound. Fornication is not getting together. It is helping each other hate God. Pornography is not private time. It is defiance of the holiness of God. Betrayal of a spouse, if we are married, and the love of sinful things. The end of these things is not life, it is death. It is not hope, it is judgment. It is not indifference, it is righteous wrath. We know that a true inheritance secured by the Holy Spirit cannot be taken away. We also know that a true inheritance will make itself known in the fight of the Christian, the conviction of the Christian, the loves of a Christian. A true Christian will make it to heaven because of the grace of God because of the forgiveness provided by the death of Jesus Christ for every sexual sin, every coveting thought. Jesus paid the price for every Christian for past, present, future sins. And the Christian so loves his or her Lord that the hunger and the desire is to reflect the glory of the gospel in our daily, mundane, private, secretive choices. A true Christian hates sin. This is the grace of warnings in the Bible. Dead men and women do not respond to warning signs about a cliff. Live men and women do. That's how warnings are used graciously in the Bible. It's not that it's untrue. If you keep on this path, you will fall. That's a true statement. For any human being, if you keep on this path, you will fall. And for the person who claims Christian status, that's a true statement. If you keep on this path, you will fall. The Christian hears that, believes it, and turns. The non-Christian who is deaf and blind, sees no sign, continues on the path, and falls. That's the complementary nature of the eternal security of the saints and the reality and need of warnings in the Bible. The true Christian responds to legitimate warnings that are just an observation of a fact about human existence under God's sovereignty. The false professing Christian, hears no warning, cares for no warning, continues and falls. The 
lifestyle of purity is proof that a Christian has the deposit of heaven, the Holy Spirit leading them in holiness, rather than the spirit of the power of the air leading them in disobedience and death. Let me give you some application categories. If any of us have minimized a pattern of lust or sexual compromise, please feel the warning of this passage. Please. I am applying this to myself in conviction. I was confessing to the Lord this morning in prayer, Lord, forgive me for that compromise. There's no scandalous sin. I'm not bringing something to you in some way. I'm just, I'm just saying, I, I am convicted of sin here. As I, I pray I always will be as I read God's word, and I pray you are as well. If there has been a pattern of lust or sexual compromise in any way, even the tacit approval or some <laughs> legitimized expression in some way, feel the warning of this passage. This warning should drive us to the cross of Christ, which is the only explanation for inheritance that is given to anybody, the only reason that a sinner could be a saint. It's right here in the passage, and it drives us back to chapter 1. The only way sinners who would always live this way could be inherited in the kingdom of God or saints or have a rightful place before God is because of the cross of Christ. And if we have minimized a pattern of love, lust or compromise, let it drive us to the cross and remember again that Jesus Christ died for those sins and that which we would minimize and indulge in, he suffered for and paid for. Let the cross reveal the reality of this temptation towards sin, not the culture. Let the cross and not the culture reveal the reality of a particular excursion towards sin. The cross reveals God's perspective of it and God's solution for it if we repent and receive his forgiveness. The cross at the same time reveals the way we can remember the cost of our inheritance and the severity of that cost in each sin being paid for in Jesus. Repent. Turn from the pattern. Listen up. And let your pattern display your inheritance. If you are currently fighting for purity, you're aware of moments of impurity, but genuinely, you are seeking to resist the temptations of sin. You're seeking to be transparent with close friends. Let me celebrate with you the promise that the fight for purity brings. The fight for purity, not perfect, but a genuine pattern of fighting for purity growing maybe slowly, but growing gradually more as the master of sinful urges, becoming increasingly transparent with dear and trusted friends. That fight reveals something about you. It reveals that you have seen and you are seeing the glory of Jesus Christ dying for sinners and the longing to be in the throne room of God. Well done. If you are fighting for purity, well done. Well done. Hear an advanced echo of what you will hear in the end. Well done. Good and faithful fighting servant. Well done. Be encouraged and rejoice in the evidence of your citizenship and your right of place given by Jesus Christ. If you are a person who does not follow the Bible at all, or you wouldn't even call yourself a Christian, please hear the truthfulness of the Bible. The Bible is the most real thing there is in a culture that celebrates unreality and contradiction. It's the, it's the realest thing there is. And like a really real thing, it tells you the real bad news so that it can tell you the good news. This is the real thing. This is the truth. There is a truth, and this is it. 
a lie that these things are inconsequential and it's just about managing your personal preference is simply a lie. It's simply not true. The end of those things is judgment. But the good news of the Bible is whatever your previous pattern is, you can now make a beeline to the cross of Jesus Christ where Jesus died for those who have given into this sin. You can receive his forgiveness paid for in full and you can enjoy fellowship with him as a replacement for the lie of continued lust and craving. You know as well as I do, the temporary high leads immediately to a fresh craving and desperation for a new high. Love of Jesus reveals a security and a fellowship and a hope and a comfort that replaces all of those things. Lust preys on the weaknesses of our flesh and the need we have for refreshment and fellowship. It preys on those things. Those are like doors that lust runs into when we're tired and when we're lonely. Lust runs in the door and offers itself. But the Bible says Jesus Christ is at the door, knocking, saying, I will be with you. Come to me if you're weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Lust screams in argument. No, he won't. No, he won't. He'll have you sit down. He'll want to talk to you. I can give you instant relief and distraction. Jesus says, trust me. 10 minutes with me will give you more rest than any amount of time. It'll be slower. It'll take some work. He's going to be screaming at us while we do it, demanding that you come indulge him. But not very long after that, your soul will experience an increase in peace, an increase in rest. But if you go with him, he'll be laughing at you in no time and offering you something bigger and better. And then he'll laugh at you again. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you. Come to me, all the lonely and forsaken. I will never leave you or forsake you. If you want to fight purity, but you feel helpless and hopeless, and if the cycle of failure, confession, resolve, new failure has become as predictable as the sunrise and the sunset, let me remind you of the power of God and of the provisions of God. God uses warnings. He also uses a reminder of the inheritance in this very passage. He uses our calling as saints. And if we've been walking through Ephesians, he uses the community of saints as well. This is a major reason we build small groups into the lifeblood of this church so that people can build good friendships, trusted friendships, confidential friendships, that they can sit down and say, brother, sister, I am tempted If you don't have a friend like that, let me encourage you, start the process of making one. If you haven't laid a groundwork of close and ongoing relationship so that that kind of depth of intimacy would just seem like a natural next step, let me encourage you, start building relationships so that you can have trusted and trustworthy friends to share this kind of needed confession too and receive their encouragement and prayer. There's a gift in the church when brothers and sisters can speak the truth in love to one another and help us to grow in the grace of God. Take advantage of it. Lust thrives on deceitfulness and isolation. Community and loving truth is an antidote to this poison. Brothers and sisters, he has chosen you. Saints, if you call on Jesus as Savior and Lord. He has given you a future and a hope that cannot be taken away, an inheritance undefiled, kept for us in heaven. He has paid for every past sexual sin 
And if you look back on your past with pain and regret, do not confuse regret for condemnation. There may be pain as we look to the past. It is not the same thing as condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who live inside the Savior who died and rose again. God bore that sin away, and you bear it no more. Also, do not confuse the difference between condemnation and conviction. If you are convicted of a current pattern of sin, let me appeal to you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no actual judgment, but there is the gift of repentance and fresh resolve and receiving a reminder that that sin has been paid for. Take advantage of that conviction this morning. Whether this is a serious and devastating expression of sin or this is a just as serious in a moral realm but not as relationally catastrophic expression of sin, whatever it is, bring it to the cross, receive fresh conviction this morning. And I I would be remiss because this was just on my heart from the beginning of thinking about this message. I could be wrong in this, but I, I just had the impression that someone listening to this message, either live or maybe online, is currently engaged or has been engaged in an unconfessed Um, adulterous relationship. Certainly all of us face the possibility of being tempted in that. So for all of us, let's receive this warning. But if that is you, please, please repent. Turn from that sin. If you're married, confess it to your spouse. I will gladly, we will gladly help to comfort, to encourage, to remind you of the grace of God in response of repentance and faith. But help is not available for those who live in darkness. If you are contemplating or you have started a relationship that could lead in that direction, Be warned. This sin does not lead to heaven. Turn, repent, confess, be broken before God, and receive the gift of comforting mercy and forgiveness. It is available today, We do not know whether our hearts will be so hard tomorrow that we will no longer be listening. Christians, let us be grateful because apart from the grace of God, this is the final thing we would hear. final thing every Christian would hear before they went into eternity would be no impure, immoral, covetous person can be in this kingdom. What Christians will hear who fight for purity and reveal their inheritance is welcome, child, into the inheritance of my father. Let's look forward to that day. Let's act like we can't wait to get there. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you created a solution for this kind of sin. Lord, we are so grateful, Lord. And we pray and we ask you that you would forgive us for any expression, even any subtle approval of this kind of sin. 
Lord, I pray for those who have been broken by the sins of others in this way, who have been wounded by the sins of others in this way. And I, I pray for them, Lord. I pray that you would comfort them, that they would be comforted by your word that calls what they know to be wicked, wicked. Lord, let that be a comfort that you agree with the outrage and the pain that they felt. Lord, there's a comfort in that. It turns the world right side up. What they know to be wicked is wicked. And that you are a God of righteousness and love and affection and purity. Comfort anyone in that category this morning. And Lord, those of us that experienced conviction, Lord, we come to you and we bow before your cross and we confess our sins and we receive your delightful forgiveness and assurance of hope and peace. Help us to help one another, not in self-righteousness, but in broken love. Make us a church that is evidently running towards heaven. In Jesus' name.